there we go. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for introducing me. So um, I just want to say that this talk, it doesn't replicate what happens in the wonderful CMALT talks that ALT put on throughout the year. This is basically how I did it. And um, to say, you know, I've called it crossing the finishing line because it was a very long journey for me. It took about nine years from start to finish. And you'll, you'll find out why as I go through it. But um, was it worth it? Oh, hell yes. And I'm going to show you why and what it means to me to actually be able to put the letters CMOL after my name. So a little bit about me. So I've had many hats over the last 12 years um, since graduating. So I started out as a teacher and a trainee student teacher um, and FE at Salisbury College. I then went through various roles in widening participation, uh, research, uh, a marketing officer. But I finally landed in um, Roger Emery's uh, e-learning team at Southampton Solent University. And that's where I really found a subject that I loved and I knew I wanted a lifelong career in. Um, about eight years after joining that team, I relocated to Oxfordshire. You know, you fall in love and you, you have to move sometimes. And I got a job at Cranford University. And that's where we specialised in postgraduate courses and CPD, um, mainly to the defence sector and the MOD. Um, and then during the summer this year, I transitioned over to Catalyst IT. So you could call it my dream job, as I am now a learning technologist to learning technologists, and um, I couldn't be happier. So things that I love and things that uh, motivate me. So Moodle and Mahara, wonderful platforms. Okay. They, they can you know, be improved. However, what I love is how they can actually support teaching and learning. Uh, I, open, I also love open badges, open practice, as and when I can, and also my PLN. I love my personal learning network. I, I don't know if I could be where I am now without them. So this is kind of like me giving back to my network as well. So all of you that haven't yet got your CMALT or have just started or thinking about started, hopefully this will give you the motivation you need to just get on and do it. But let's see. So before I start, I wanted to share this wonderful um, image done by Brian Mathers. And I'm just going to share a link to it. Give me one second. So I'm going to put it in the chat now. This image to me sums up CMALT in a nutshell. Every time I look at it, I think of new things I could have put in my CMALT portfolio. So if, you're, if you've got 10 minutes and you can just sit there and look at this image, I am sure you're going to come up with new ideas to stick in your portfolio. You, you might be spoiled for choice, I don't know, but I think this is a wonderful graphic. So thank you, Brian, for doing this because I think it's wonderful. Okay, so that was my introduction. And um, this is what I'm actually going to be talking about. And um, yeah, it could take half an hour, it could be shorter, it could be longer. I, I can waffle, I just got to you know, rein it in because I do get excited sometimes. Um, so I'm going to talk about why I chose to do CMALT. We all have our reasons for doing it. I have about five different ones throughout the years. Um, I'm also going to say about how I actually sought inspiration, so where, who I actually look to to help me get through the process. Um, I then want to talk about content and structure because there's so many ways to do it, and this is how I did it. But sorry, somebody just put waffles. <laughs> Mm, yummy. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the feedback process because this is something as a new starter to CMO, you have you don't really know what goes on in the feedback area. So I just wanted to share what happens because it really, really helped me. And then finally, how it's impacting me right now and what my next steps are based on being a CMO member. So here we go. So why did I choose to do CMO? So as I said, um, in 2009, I joined um, the Learning Technology Unit with Roger Emery, and he suggested that I do it because I'd come from a teaching background and I was a lover of technology back then using Moodle to teach with. He said, well, this is a way of you being able to see where you are and then fill any gaps that you have. And what he can do is then work with me to design projects to fill those gaps. So that was great. That's a really, really good starter. But then you know, something nice and shiny was dangled in front of me. I was offered to do a PG cert in blended learning. So CMOT went on the back burner and off I went to do a qualification. Once I did that, I also 
um, started thinking about you know, my, my career, what I wanted to do. And again, after I finished the PG Cert, I went back to my portfolio and my gosh, it was so outdated. Already I'd learned so, so much. So I had to start again, completely started over. However, this time I got a promotion shortly afterwards. So once again, it was put on a back burner. And then in 2014, um, I decided to rope together some colleagues. So we thought we'd do this slimming world approach where we shame each other into doing sections, you know, a bit of group encouragement, help each other out. But then I was offered the chance to do the fellowship in HE. So I thought, well, OK, I need to do that. And once again, see what went on the back burner. So as you can see, it's been a lot of stop and start, stop and start. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you have been through that as well. So, as I said, I moved to Oxfordshire and started a new job at Cranfield University. And I said, right, that's it. No more stopping and starting. I am going to get this thing done. I want this. So I started. My new line manager approved it, said, yes, that would be wonderful. Nobody has it here yet. Let's go for it. But then I fell pregnant and then took some time off work. And then when I came back to work, I had a half finished portfolio again which was again started from scratch and I thought okay right no more excuses I need to do this I, I really really need to get it done this time so I worked my bottom off got all my evidence together I started putting together my portfolio and then a few months before the submission date I had a wobble and I'll tell you about my wobble a little bit further along but the big motivation for me actually being able to get it done and submitted this year was I registered for CML. I didn't think about it. I didn't plan to do it. I actually just thought, do you know what? Just get it done. Just register yourself. Then the clock starts ticking and then you've got no excuse. So this is kind of four and a half attempts at it. So inspiration. So this is why I love my PLN. So look to your group, look to your circle of friends, colleagues, influencers, and see who has got CMALT. So I want to do a shout out for David Hopkins. And this is his wonderful blog here, Don't Waste Your Time. And he shared his experience of not only compiling his CMOP pages, but also his own reflections on his reflections of doing it. And that was a really, really good help for me. Um, searching on Google, so I just Googled CMOP holders and uh, Mira Vogel popped up. And this was a game changer because she actually included her feedback sheet, which completely dispelled the myth as to what goes on when your portfolio is being peer assessed. So. This is why I'm going to share with you my, you know, my feedback at the end as well to give you an idea of what to expect. So again, thank you, Mira, for being brave and showing us you know, your feedback. Uh, colleagues as well. So um, my maternity cover, Angelique Bodart, she came to Cranfield already with CMALT. And luckily, we'll be, we were able to hold on to her when I came back. And she was my agony aunt. She sat two meters across the desk from me. And my gosh, the poor girl listening to me whinge and moan about, am I reflecting enough? Have I gone too deep? Does this evidence show this? You know, so it was really good to actually have somebody to bounce ideas off who has been through the process herself. Um, and then shared portfolios on the CMALT side. So um, when I registered, I had access to all these wonderful portfolio examples. And uh, you know, another shout out to Theresa McKinnon and Sheila McNeil because they, um, you know, theirs were really, really influential, instrumental of, get, of helping me get them done. So that's kind of like my journey to actually compiling it and who inspired me. And the next stage was actually the building of the portfolio. So this is the structure. So, of course, you're allowed to structure it however you want, but this is the process that helped me. And this is what I did. So planning was always paper based. I used to print out the CMOT. So every time I attempted a new start to CMOT, I would print out the prospectus and then scribble on the back ideas of different projects that could go with each section. And it didn't matter if the same project could go under three of them. It just means that when I had everything down on paper, I can then pick and choose and then fine tune each 
response so that it made it appropriate. A bit like how you change your CV depending on who you're applying for. Exactly the same. You sort of change the, the um, well, the context to fit um, each section. And then I use Google Docs to actually write each section. So this was great, especially as I did a lot of traveling. Um, so I could access Google Docs on my iPad in offline mode. So if I don't have internet connection, I could just keep writing. Uh, the joy of Google Docs, as we found out yesterday, is it could be accessed anywhere. And they're really rather reliable. Um, but then when it actually came to compiling and presenting my portfolio, I obviously used Mahara. Um, I'm a big Mahara advocate. I've been av av uh, promoting it for the past 10 years in the various universities that I've worked in. But also, this is my real opportunity to use it as a learner, you know, practice what I preach. Oh my gosh, it was a learning curve. Oh, thank you, Mark, for sharing Mira's portfolio. Yeah, it was brilliant. So, this is kind of how I structured it. So everybody is different. Everybody chooses a different tool and that is wonderful. And that was what's so lovely about looking through all these e-portfolios. Um, everyone is different because it suits our own personality. Um, so I went for a one page per section. So everything to do with operational issues, I put in one page. And I know people like to separate it out into lots of different windows, but I wanted to keep everything together because I get lost sometimes. Um, so I have the structure on the side panel, my menu. So you can see all the pages. Um, I have all the content in the center of the page. And then at the bottom, I have a link that goes on to the next page. So this is the way I decided to do this. Um, and I set, used the same format for every page. So this helped me because I could actually see how much was being done. So I could just copy and paste from my Google Doc and chuck it in there. And that was really, really good for me. Right, I talked to you about my wobble. So I had a pretty decent portfolio together around about April, maybe slightly early March. And then I saw this amazing tweet on Twitter. So some poor brave soul tweeted that they had failed, not failed, but they didn't pass CMOLT. And they actually shared their feedback as to why. And it was because the assessors didn't feel his reflections went deep enough. And that got me thinking, have I reflected deep enough? I thought I had, and he was helping me thought I had. But then again, I thought, was it actually deep enough for me? Because I'm not doing this just to get the letters C more after my name. I'm actually doing this because I want to be as good as I can be. And I want to present something that I feel 100% proud of. So again, I went to practice what I preached and I looked for different reflection models and I landed on Gibbs. And I like this because not only could I be reflective, but I could actually put some you know, emotions in there, how I was emotionally affected how um, I could actually put myself into my reflections rather coming at it from an academically written perspective where it can, so, you know, not always, but it can sometimes come across as quite dry. I wanted to make sure that I was there in the text. So um, I may have gone too deep in some of my reflections. I don't know, but I felt that I needed to do it. And it actually felt like really good therapy for me <laughs> doing it. So I thought it was great. So whoever that person was on Twitter, I can't remember his name, I have looked, but thank you so much for sharing your feedback because it really, really helped me. And I really want to find out who that is. So evidence. So I try to be as varied as possible with my evidence. So obviously I was using screen grabs of work that I did, but I also try to include videos where I could. So for example, if I'm talking about a course I've created, um, I obviously can't share a link to the course because it's um, in Moodle and um, our students at the time were MOD students. And there's all sorts of th reasons as to why I can't share things publicly. So um, what I did was I just used a very short screen capture video tool and just recorded a 30 second clip of my, my course. So scrolling up and down, showing a few of the activities just to give the assessors an idea of what it was I was talking about. And then I just uploaded them to Google Drive again, just linked to them or embedded them in the page. So screenshots are great, but 
videos that show you doing the thing or showing off the thing that you've created is a really, really good idea. So you can see I've got um, a quote up here from one of the assessors talking about how um, you know, my video on Turnitin. So this is me showing that I can use Camtasia to record a video and edit the video, use YouTube as a tool to upload it. And then I'm also demonstrating that I know the advanced features of Turnitin to an audience, which would be the students on how to access their feedback. So I'm showing a number of skills. And this is really, really good for operational um, section B, you know, having a wide range of knowledge with LT skills. So, yeah. Um, so present, obviously presentation slides, but do assessors have time to actually sit there and look through slides? Mm, I didn't know, but as again, what I, like I said, this, this portfolio was for me and I felt the presentations had some merit, so I added them. And then photos, and if you can get feedback from colleagues or students, chuck all that in there as well. So once again, you're bringing your portfolio to life. It's not just a flat um, document. It is a living, breathing, dynamic, visual portfolio. I mean, that's why we're using ePortfolio route rather than just a Word doc, because we actually want to make it digital and want to make it pop, as my old jazz teacher used to say. So next, what if you don't know the answer? Just ask. It's absolutely fine. I struggled with section three. I always study uh, struggle, struggled with the wider context because I didn't know enough and I felt embarrassed about not knowing enough and I just it kept avoiding it. And I thought, you know what, you have to do it. <laughs> you know, there's a reason why they asked you to do it. So I picked um, some very difficult topics and I was very, very honest in my portfolio and said, I don't know enough, but this is what I think the answer is and I'm gonna find out. So I actually contacted people who did know. And OK, I still don't have all the answers. And like I said, in my portfolio, I was very honest that I don't have all the answers. But I started to ask the questions. And when it comes to my follow up portfolio in a few years, I've um, you know, I know where to carry on and to hopefully close that gap. So don't be afraid to ask. And if you are asking, uh, make sure they know that you are gathering evidence for a portfolio because it ensures that they, you get a very quick response, a proper response at that too. So feedback. So I'm, I mean, I'm not showing off here. This is just one part of my um, feedback. And this is something that I gained from Mira. So um, you're assessed by two assessors, a lead and a second assessor. But then there's also a scale. So there's strong and adequate, which are both passes. And then inadequate, you haven't quite made it. And this was good because in my head, it's like, no, it has to pass. It has to pass. It's like, no, no, there's two levels of pass. There's just, you know, there's OK. You don't have to go over the top. You can just put in an OK portfolio and it's all fine. But, you know, if I wanted strong, I could you know, work a bit harder on bits. So this was um, a really good thing that I got from Mira's portfolio. I could see what the feedback was and look, look at her portfolio and say, do I agree? And then maybe look at um, what I've written and whether or not it actually makes sense to me and whether I feel it was the right level. So, yeah, I'm happy to share my feedback forms with you. Um, I'll put that online. I can't, however, share my portfolio. Um, it is a shame, but like I said, I am very honest in it and I'm working with a university with contracts with the MOD and I'm pretty sure they don't want my honest thoughts and appraisals in there. Um, there is a rigorous process called permission to publish at Cranfield and I would never have got it through. <laughs> so I didn't even bother trying. But I am very, very happy to um, share a Mahara template if anybody wants to use Mahara if they have a Mahara ePortfolio system in their institution I'm very happy if you want it and I'm happy to create it um, so the feedback and then this bit popped up this bit oh my gosh at the end there's a separate section for the four core principles oh my gosh this was absolutely brilliant for me because I could see at the end you actually marked on the commitment to exploring understanding um, the you know keeping up to date those four things um that you know meant to show be shown throughout your portfolio and i thought well i remember when i used to assess um key stage one portfolios for uh, apprenticeships 
and for uh, MVQ2 portfolios. And it used to drive me nuts running, having to go through people's portfolios, trying to find stuff and cross-reference stuff. But well, wouldn't it be good if I actually put a page in my portfolio at the end to summarize where in my portfolio I felt I met these criteria, these principles? So this was another game changer for me. So again, thank you, Mira. You're you're amazing. So if you want to see what that looked like, um, it's just a summary slide right at the end, the full principles and how I feel I met them. Uh, it's nothing big, nothing fancy, because I've done all the hard work throughout the rest of my portfolio. But this is just me just concluding each bit. And yeah. So the last bit, so the impact steps. So yes, that is a photo of me doing archery. So normally you put in a picture of a target, don't you? And I thought, well, I've got my own target and me and my arrows shooting at 90, uh, 90 meters away. I'm quite proud of that. So um, what I put down in my future plans, and I'm a big believer of as soon as you write it down on paper, it becomes a real thing. It's not just some you know, concept in the air. It's actually there. You have a target to work towards. So <laughs> Debbie, I'm just reading your comments. Um, so. Yeah, I put down my four things that I wanted to achieve before my next CMOLT review. Um, so there's the wonderful digital, digital scholar um, course, which I put down and I had time this summer to finish it. So I was, I've done that. Um, actually submit a paper for a journal um, that was published last month. And that was my first ever paper. So that was a really, really good career goal for me to get. I put down about completing my senior fellowship at the HEA and I was halfway through it, but I've now left the higher education sector and it, I don't feel it's relevant in my role now. I mean, it'd be nice to have, but it's not necessary. Um, and then, you know, start a master's in a suitable subject. OK, um, I've started a new job. This is something that I could bring to my employer when I have my first PDR to say this was one of my goals. Can we do it? So that's you know that's that's why it's important to put your future steps your future plans in your portfolio and really really think about it because as i say as soon as you put it on paper it becomes a real thing for you to work towards and then sort of benefits to my employer so for cranfield it meant that i was reassuringly competent and capable so not only did i have a fellowship at the hea which meant that lecturers knew that I've come from a similar background to them and I can sympathise you know, entirely with what they're going through. But also with CMO, I can say, look, I have been assessed by my peers. I've been deemed competent. I know my stuff. You just let me get on with my job. So that was quite cool. And then when I transferred to Catalyst a few months ago, you know, my, my boss said, you know, it was um, something about cl our clients being reassured that we understand their frame of reference so like i said i'm now a you know e-learning specialist but the people that i talk to are learning technologists and it people in the universities and colleges that we support so it's it's good that they know that i have the cmot standard so they know that i know my stuff as well and then finally benefits to me because this is why i did it i did it for me so validation from my peers you know, to be recognized as a member of a wonderful um, bunch of people who you know absolutely love the alt community and um, i'm looking forward to now being able to go to more alt events um, now that i'm at catalyst but it was a big boost to my confidence because when i came back from maternity leave i was not well and being able to get through this was just absolutely spot on and then finally, I have an excuse now to keep doing more because I can say, right, I need stuff for my next email portfolio. I need examples. I need projects. And it means I can then keep going and just push myself and find those gaps in my knowledge and fill them. So this is kind of like my journey through CML, why I did it and how it has impacted me where I am now. So to conclude, um, so okay as i said i had glowing feedback i put a lot of effort into it and i probably did go well over and above what was meant to be in there but like i said i did it for me and to know that it was recognized as being good was just really really good for me so my seven tips because you know i didn't want to squeeze into five i didn't have enough to put into to ten i thought well seven of these are my honest ones 
So as soon as you know that you definitely want to do CMOL, register because the clock starts ticking and it actually gives you a deadline to work to. So register. I also recommend you look at at least five CMOL portfolios, lots of different ones from different people. So ones from people that you know, and then some that, you know, of people you don't know. Um, it's really, really good to get a broad overview of what's out there. I mean, what I found was is some of the reflections on some of them that I saw were very thin and they still passed. I thought, well, OK, that's thin for me, but it's obviously enough for the writer who's writing them and enough for the assessors to get an understanding. So, you know, it, it was very, very reassuring. Um, and also plan your examples on paper first. So just write down all the projects that you've been involved with and how they could fit into each section. Just scribble it down, scribble it down. Um, you know, it's a really, really good starting point. I am very much a paper and pen girl, even though I am a learning technologist and a lover of technology, I still like paper and pen. If you have any gaps in your knowledge, so things that you don't know, ask, just ask, and then evidence the fact that you, know, you are being brutally honest. I don't know this, I want to find out. However, look, I know who to ask, and I know how to ask, and here's my answers. Uh, fifth one is user reflection model. Now, I did this, as I said, because I wanted to make sure I was doing the best for me. Um, and I found it really, really helped structure my responses. So I had my description, I had my reflection, and then I had my evidence and action plan at the end. And that really, really helped. Uh, six, put yourself in it. You know, it's a portfolio of your professional work. You know, bring it to life with your personality if you can. Uh, it doesn't have to be dry. I mean, if you have a dry personality, you know, fair enough. But, um, you know, try and put you in there because it's humans that are going to be reading your work and assessing you. So, you know, just say hello to them. And then seven, and this is <laughs> the thing that took me a long time to, to understand and accept, you know, be happy to draw a line under it. It's never going to be finished. You're always going to be finding new stuff to talk about. And that's the joy of CML. You can do it again in three years with your updates. So just be happy with what you've done, because I'm sure if you are happy with it, it's going to be enough. So that is me. Um, and you know, everybody loves a good Venn diagram. You know, having a competency there written in front of you with your reflections and evidence, that is your kick ass portfolio. So Good luck, and I am happy to take any questions. And if you wanted to contact me, this is me. Thank you. Sam, thank you so much. That was incredibly motivating, and I'm <laughs> looking forward confidently to, to finishing mine in, in eight years' time, having started <laughs> last year. Um, but um, we have got plenty of time for questions. So if people do have things they'd like to ask um feel free uh, it looks like debbie's got a question so debbie do take the microphone oh hi hi tom hi sam can you hear me yes oh lovely that was brilliant really really loved that that was so honest so um <laughs> amazingly reflective i'm really impressed <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, how long would you say, maybe I missed it because my um, my headphones were kind of dipping in and out, but how long would you say that it actually took you when you, you've kind of decided, right, that's it, I'm doing it, I'm getting it in? How long do you, do you think it actually took to get to get something that you were happy with to submit? Oh, my gosh. Um, I'm just thinking, because obviously you've worked very... on it for so long, haven't you? But. <laughs> I think it was, I mean, comparing it to the fellowship of the HEA that I did, I wrote that in four, de four days, mm -hmm. whereas CMO, I reckon if I'd have just sat there and did it in one go, it would have taken me about a week, two weeks, yeah. if I'd have done nothing else but CMO, two weeks, and that's because I just kept editing it and adding more and changing bits. Yeah, exactly. It's it, like like an inner editor, isn't it, that creeps up on you as you're writing it yeah. all the time. <laughs> Yeah, it's the, it's the same with like this presentation. I have changed it so many times just because new things come flooding in. And, you know, it's that Brian Mathers picture. Every time you look at it, new stuff pops into your head. So 
you know, like I say, just be happy and draw a line under it. And yeah. I'm glad I did it. <laughs> I'm glad I, I did it to, you know, the level that I've done it. But, oh, that's yeah. good. And, you, and you, you picked this really good to sit to hear it from your point of view and that you've um, that was a really key moment for me when you said you'd bring your personality into it. Because I, I really think that's where I've been going wrong. Because I, I, like you, I've got so many false starts <laughs> all over yeah. the place. And, um, and I, I really felt I was boring myself. I thought, nobody's ever going to want to read this. So I, I thought, that's it. That's what I need to do. So, yeah, that's really encouraging. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> no worries. Thank okay. you. See if any more um, questions come in, Sam. I was wondering whether your um, earlier attempts um, to, you know, your your sort of abortive um, stop starts were helpful in, in you know, a, a kind of progressive articulation of what you were trying to say, or were they generally just more frustrating? Um, whew. I think they helped because it was like every time I did it, I added another layer on top. I mean the uh, operational issues section a that has gone through there's four different projects I've done for that before I actually fin finally landed on the last one that I actually did about the employability skills for the students but it started off um, talking about Turnitin workshops then it changed to oh what else did we do no it just it, it, each time I just used it as a platform to either rewrite what I'd already written or just start again from scratch. And, you know, looking back, I'm fine with that process, but at the time it was frustrating. But I think it was just, I was just very excitable and really, really wanted to do the best that I could. Well, I think I can definitely detect a perfectionist <laughs> freak. <laughs> um, Only in some areas of my life, not all of them. <laughs> it looks like Sarah's got a question. So Sarah, do go ahead. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, and thank you, Sam. That was really great to hear all of that story, um, which has obviously been a long project for you. And um, well done on staying focused on the end goal. I think that it's so easy to lose sight of what it is that you want, but you just stuck with it uh, through pregnancy as well, which is really great. Um, so I did post a question in the chat, but I think it's, it's everyone's saying thank you so much that it's gone off to me. <laughs> I just wanted to know, um, Aside from your mental relationship you had with a, a lady whose name I've forgotten, I'm afraid. Angelique. Yes. Um, did you then run your end portfolio by a critical friend before you submitted? Someone who hadn't seen it during the process you'd been through? No, I didn't. And the reason why is because uh, <laughs> I wanted to just submit it. If I'd have mm. sent it to somebody and they gave me feedback, I would have had another wobble. And I would have questioned myself and, you know, because this was at a time, you know, I mean, it's not that long ago, but it's at a time where I had very little confidence in myself at the time for being unwell. So I just wanted to submit it. I just wanted to get it in. OK, well, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, well done for being so brave on, on that, I suppose. I'd be interested to know if anyone else who's um, been through this process then or is going through it now is thinking about that um i just think you know for, if you've written for papers which you have now and I, I don't know if you saw but i read your paper just yesterday funnily enough so that's okay. really great that you got that published um <laughs> you sometimes uh, get feedback that you just weren't expecting by someone who's looking at it for the first time so mm -hmm. i just wondered if it's uh, a practice that people engage with in this particular context so i'd be interested to know if anyone else has thought about that or, or done that but that that was my question thanks very much <laughs> I think um, Sarah, um, you know, going on um, feedback which I received from people who've done CMORT as part of um, an institutional group, um, so you might have five, ten or, or fifteen people kind of going through the process together, that is really, really helpful. Uh, but equally, as, as Sam says, you know, um, it doesn't actually have to be a, a finished product or it's never going to be perfect, so just getting it in there and, and getting the feedback from the assessors um, you know, that may be may be equivalent in some ways. Oh, OK, I've got a, there's a question there from Vicky about um, how long I was at Cranfield. So I was at Cranfield for three and a half years. And um, yes, all my evidence was based at Cranfield, uh, apart from the specialist area, which was about my involvement in Mahara. So 
obviously I had 10 years worth of experience to pull into that so that was just ram packed full of examples of where I've engaged in the Mahara community so yes pretty much the whole thing was based on my time at Cranfield but um, obviously my past experiences at Solent informed my approach to how I did things at Cranfield so yeah I, I hope that answers that question <laughs> good I'm glad it helps Well, um, that's been, I think we can, I can see from the chat, you know, that's been an incredibly helpful session, Sam. So um, I think you've, you've more than, um, more than acquitted yourself of your, of your, <laughs> of your um, personal duty to, to your, um, to the old community and your network. Um, and I think, um, you know, everyone's really grateful um, to you for sharing so honestly and um, comprehensively. There we go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. No, this is, this is, yeah, um, as you know, I've been, I've emailed uh, Alt to say that I would love to share my experience to help others. And um, I was advised to, you know, put in a proposal to do it here for Alt C Winter Conference. And um, I'm glad I did. So this is my first ever Alt presentation. So another milestone, career milestone to tick off the list. So I'm very, very happy. So thank you. Thank you, Sam, and we will look forward to hearing about it in the CMALT portfolio update. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, just to say to everyone, um, thank you very much for coming, and the, the session recording will be made available um, through the conference session page, and I've been putting the link to that in the chat. And if you haven't yet exhausted this topic, um, you feel free to pop along to the virtual cafe and continue the conversation. The next winter conference session will be starting at 11 o'clock. Um, so I hope to see many of you continuing to participate. Thank you again to Sam Taylor, our presenter. And I think you've had plenty of applause, but I'm going to add some more. Thank you very much. Thank you.